sniper is on the loose on Long Island. His random pattern leaves investigators with only one clue, the ammunition he uses to hunt total strangers. Investigators in Kentucky try to determine the fate of a woman who has disappeared. Her family suspects the worst, but there are no clues, no motive, and no crime scene. In Georgia, a young man is shot to death on a fishing trip. Police find the body of his fiancée seven miles downstream. But spent bullets are the only clues the killer left behind. In a fraction of a second, a single bullet can shatter many lives. But forensic scientists can decipher clues etched in lead when innocent victims are caught in the line of fire. In this episode, some of the names have been changed to protect the identity of the victims and their families. How is everything? Everything's fine. Thanks. On July 22nd, 1994, Sharon Chaffetz joined her husband, Stephen, for a late dinner at a Long Island restaurant. After many years of marriage, they were looking forward to their daughter's wedding just two weeks away. Suddenly, the window near Stephen's head shattered and he slumped to the floor. The restaurant owner quickly called for help. Suffolk County, New York police and paramedics responded to the call within minutes. But it was too late. Stephen Chaffetz was dead from a single gunshot wound to the chest. No one in the restaurant had seen the shooter. Police processed the crime scene for clues. The trajectory of the bullet suggested that someone had fired a high-powered rifle in the restaurant from an area across the street. No one knew whether the shooting was random or if Chaffetz had been targeted for murder. Lieutenant John Girash of the Suffolk County Police Department led the investigation. He started by looking into the victim's background. In most homicide investigations, one of the first things that detectives do is to try to learn as much as they can about the victim. Most often, uh, the motive lies in, within the, the life of the victim and what's going on uh, with him. Investigators spoke with the victim's family and friends. Has he had any contact with any other... Stephen Chaffetz, a practicing attorney and a CPA, was highly regarded in the community. According to those close to him, he had no enemies. Investigators were perplexed. Why would someone want to kill Stephen Chaffetz? At autopsy, the coroner recovered a 35 caliber bullet a type most commonly used in high-powered rifles. It was sent to the ballistics lab for further testing. Four days later, 23-year-old Andy Gomez was working his shift inside the cashier's booth at a nearby gas station. Without warning, a single shot rang out. The booth's window was double insulated and bulletproof. Gomez was lucky to be alive. Within minutes, police secured the area. They found no trace of the shooter. Gomez had little information to offer police. There had been no attempted robbery, and he didn't see anyone prior to the shooting. The bullet, which fragmented upon impact with the bulletproof glass, was all the shooter left behind. Police collected the fragments and sent them to the lab. 
The MO for both attacks was identical. Police hoped ballistics analysis could tell them more. After noting the similarities between the two shootings, investigators working the Chaffetz murder shifted their focus. The investigation became more complicated because it, it was obvious to us that the motive did, had very little to do, if anything, to do with the two individuals. Rather, these were now appearing to be random acts. And it's those kinds of random acts that make these kinds of investigation most difficult. The metal fragments from the gas station were sent to the Suffolk County Crime Lab. Although they were too small to compare to the bullet recovered from the body of Stephen Chaffetz, scientists were able to determine their metallic content. A visual inspection under a microscope revealed the bullets shared a common coloration. The fragments from the gas station and the bullet that killed Chaffetz both had copper jackets. It was the first small step in linking the two shootings. But examiners could not say with certainty that the bullets were fired from the same weapon. On August 3rd, a week after the gas station shooting, 42-year-old single mother, Kelly Spate, was finishing her shift at a local fast food restaurant. A single shot ripped through the window, hitting Kelly. The manager called 911. Suffolk County police were dispatched to the scene. The victim was badly injured, but still alive. The single bullet passed through her arm and then through her chest, barely missing her vital organs. Police secured the area and interviewed the restaurant's manager. Neither he nor any of the restaurant patrons had seen the shooter. The bullet was found lodged in the wall. Despite the frustrating lack of eyewitnesses in all three cases, the police had an intact bullet for comparison. Forensic specialists examined the evidence at the Suffolk County Crime Lab. The 35 caliber slug was the same size as the bullet that killed Stephen Chaffetz. The two bullets were examined side by side under a high-powered comparison microscope. Each gun has a set of markings inside the barrel called lands and grooves. These markings are etched into the bullet as it travels down the barrel, leaving a series of ridges behind. These ridges are similar to fingerprints in that no two weapons leave identical lands and grooves. When the ridges from both bullets were analyzed, they matched. Lab examiners had finally provided investigators with solid proof that the shootings were related. They told us unequivocally that that bullet and the murder bullet from the first incident were fired from one and the same weapon. That told us as much as anything else, uh, these were all related cases, and with that, likely at the hands of one individual. Police had no idea how or when the shooter would strike next. And according to Assistant Chief John McAlone of the Suffolk County Police Department, there were no viable suspects. We didn't have anyone to really concentrate on or any even small group to concentrate on. So the major obstacle in this case was identity. Who could it be? Who was it? And how could we stop him? How could we prove a case against him? As news of the random shooting spread, the community panicked. The press dubbed the unknown assailant the Suffolk Sniper. Investigators feared they were dealing with a madman who shot total strangers for the sheer thrill of the hunt. Suffolk County Police continued their search for an elusive sniper one man was already dead, and two others had narrowly escaped his deadly aim. Investigators were baffled. There was nothing similar about our victims. 
this presented almost a nightmare investigatively to detectives because it doesn't give you any direction to start with. Investigators began by compiling a list of individuals who owned 35 caliber rifles. They also searched police records for recently arrested individuals charged with gun-related crimes. Publishers of various survivalist magazines were asked to send in lists of subscribers from the Long Island area. Police canvassed neighborhoods in the vicinity of the shootings. But residents reported they had not noticed any suspicious activity. Patrol officers set up roadblocks and conducted interviews with thousands of motorists. After several months, investigators had entered over 200,000 names into a database specially modified for the investigation. From these names, Sergeant Edward Light called 600 strong leads. We're looking for people that appeared more than once. For example, if they were held a hunting license and they subscribed to a survivalist magazine and perhaps were on parole, that would raise a flag to the investigators. The Suffolk County Police Department mobilized every available resource to find the killer. The massive police presence in the area of the shootings also helped to calm the fearful community. They visibly saw a lot more patrol cars than they used to. They saw the helicopter overhead, more than likely. They, they saw the canine units all deployed within a certain area, of a narrow area of maybe nine or 10 miles. Police were desperate to generate leads. After developing a psychological portrait of the sniper, they appealed to the public for assistance. A detailed analysis of the crime scenes revealed a familiar pattern to investigators. They described the shooter as a white male in his mid-twenties to early thirties, probably a gun lover and an avid hunter. The tactic soon paid off. Police received a call from a parole officer. One of his parolees, a man named Peter Sylvester, fit the profile of the shooter. Sylvester had an extensive criminal record, including convictions for the possession of stolen weapons. And he lived close to where the three shootings had occurred. Investigators decided to put him under surveillance. We had come to know that he was on parole, and with his parole were certain conditions that he had to meet. Our surveillance was telling us that he was violating those conditions. Within a matter of days, Sylvester was observed violating the curfew mandated in his parole. He was arrested and brought in for questioning. At the time of his arrest, Sylvester was in possession of a 9mm handgun. When asked about the sniper incidents, he denied any involvement. Police ran the serial number of the 9mm. They learned the weapon had been reported stolen from a local sports shop. Sylvester was booked for multiple parole violations, including possession of a stolen weapon. Although there was little evidence that he was the sniper, police considered him a prime suspect. How you doing? To learn more, investigators tracked down Sylvester's former employer. He told them that Sylvester had left a 410 gauge shotgun in the back of his delivery truck. Police collected the shotgun as evidence. They also continued to check all gun-related leads. One such lead led detectives to a mental hospital. There, they spoke to a man who had threatened to commit suicide with a high-powered rifle. The patient told investigators that the rifle was a 356 Remington. 
Although it was not the type of rifle used in the shootings, the patient offered investigators one intriguing piece of information. He told them he had purchased the rifle from a friend, a man named Peter Sylvester. Police ran the serial number on the patient's gun. It had been stolen from a local gun shop two weeks before the shootings began. During this robbery, two other guns were also taken, a 35 caliber Whelan rifle and a 410 gauge shotgun. The serial number of the stolen shotgun was compared to the one recovered from Sylvester's employer. They matched. The third stolen weapon, the 35 caliber rifle, was consistent with the rifle used to kill Stephen Chaffetz. But that gun was still missing. And that third weapon, that unaccounted for weapon, uh, fit almost exactly the, the description of the weapon that we were seeking as the murder weapon. Two of the three stolen guns had been linked to Sylvester. It seemed likely that he was also connected to the missing 35 caliber rifle. Now, investigators needed to prove that the missing rifle was the murder weapon. They visited the manager of the gun shop where the robbery occurred. Exactly on this. Who are we gonna get? Sales records indicated the 35 caliber rifle in question had been sold to the shop by a previous owner. Police asked for the address. At this point, investigators had but one hope, that the prior owner still had spent bullets from the rifle in his possession. If so, those bullets could be compared to the ones recovered from the crime scene. The former owner told investigators that he remembered firing practice shots into a tree during hunting season. But that was a year ago. If he could find that tree, investigators might have the evidence they needed. Suffolk County homicide detective Kevin Cronin was optimistic. He said he had hunted that mountain for about 20 years. He felt very confident that he could find the tree. His confidence rubbed off on us, and we went up there, uh, myself and, and our investigative team. Officers followed the man into the woods. He led them straight to the tree he had once used for target practice. Noting several bullet holes, officers cut the tree down. They sent a cross-section of the trunk to the Suffolk County Crime Lab. In the lab, the sections were cut open. Several bullets were recovered. Examiners could now compare these to the bullets recovered from the body of Stephen Chaffetz. The characteristics of both sets of bullets matched. Investigators had successfully used a missing rifle to link their suspect to the murder. They were slowly building their case against Peter Sylvester. A warrant was obtained to search the house Sylvester lived in with his mother. Officers believed the weapon was somewhere in the house. They checked everywhere. Hidden in the ceiling, police finally found the 35 caliber Whelan rifle. It was now up to the Suffolk County Crime Lab to prove Sylvester was the Suffolk sniper. In the lab, the rifle was fired into a water tank. The bullet was then recovered for comparison with bullets fired by the Suffolk sniper. Under the microscope, ridges on the test bullet matched the ridges on the bullet that killed Stephen Chaffetz. Without a doubt, the 35 caliber Whelan rifle was the weapon used in the shootings. Faced with the overwhelming evidence against him, 
Sylvester confessed to the shootings. He acknowledged he had never met any of his victims. From a secluded position, he waited for an easy target. He lined them up in his sights and fired. Peter Sylvester was found guilty of murder and received a sentence of 35 years to life. No motive was ever established. If we weren't able to solve this case for, for an indefinite period of time, the residents would have to go about with, with a bunker mentality. They'd have to pull down their shades at night. They'd have to look over their shoulders as they went about their daily routine. We were able to eliminate that circumstance and Suffolk County, as it was before this incident, uh, remains uh, an extremely safe pe place to live. Peter Sylvester did not know his victims. But in Kentucky, murder became a more personal matter. The serene landscape of Dry Ridge, Kentucky, hardly seems the place for a terrible crime. Then again, maybe it's the perfect place. On September 16, 1988, the parents of 28-year-old Paula Doherty reported her missing to the state police. In this rural area, the state police handle most investigations. Paula's parents hadn't heard from her for two days. It wasn't like her not to contact them or her children. Paula Doherty, a divorced mother of two, lived at her parents' house. She had been dating a man named Nathan Marksbury for six months and had been spending a lot of time with him. When Nathan heard that Paula was missing, he called the state police to offer his help, though he said he didn't know where she might be. Still, police wanted to meet with him for an interview. They drove to his trailer, located on his parents' farm. He told them that the last time he'd seen her was in the early hours of September 15th, three days earlier. They were at a club with some friends. It was closing time and their friends had left. Marksbury told police that Paula had called someone to come pick her up. He didn't know why and she wouldn't say. They waited outside. Eventually, a woman in a yellow or tan car pulled up. Paula introduced her as Shelley or Sheila. He'd never seen her before. Then they drove off and Nathan went home by himself. Marksbury said the woman was either a cousin or a friend from Cincinnati. Paula didn't seem upset. It was all very mysterious. Investigators thought so too. Sergeant Ron Harrison learned that it was out of character for Paula to simply up and leave without telling anyone. Prior to her disappearance, uh, the last family member that she talked to was her mother, who she called from the bar. Uh, at her about 10 or 10.30 that night and uh, didn't indicate to her mother at that time that she was uh, getting ready to call anybody to come and get her. She didn't indicate that she wanted her mother to try to make arrangements to have somebody come and get her or anything of that nature. Investigators spoke to the other friends who were with Paula that night. Each admitted leaving before Paula and Nathan did. And all of them said the evening didn't end on a pleasant note. When they left the bar at closing time, everything was fine. But then, in the parking lot, Marksbury grew upset over losing his keys. One of the friends tried to calm him down, and Marksbury hit him. Sergeant Harrison retraced the couple's footsteps, but found nothing in the bar parking lot. As a result of that altercation, all of these individuals at or about the same time left the parking lot. The only vehicle left on this parking lot after that time was Nathan Marksbury's vehicle and the only people who were here on this parking lot at that time 
was Nathan and Paula. And this is the last time that we've been able to establish anyone seeing Paula. Sergeant Harrison could find out nothing else about what happened that night. But witnesses claimed that in the past, they had observed Marksbury being physically abusive with girlfriends. If he had been violent with Paula, she hadn't said a word. State police had only two facts to work with. A dependable woman who disappeared unexpectedly and her boyfriend, who witnesses said was abusive. Though Nathan Marksbury was now the prime suspect in Paula's disappearance, there wasn't a shred of evidence linking him to any wrongdoing. Investigators' hands were tied. Though it seemed unlikely, it was even possible that Paula had vanished of her own free will. Paula's family wasn't keeping idle. Desperate for answers, they searched for clues on the Marksbury's farm. It caused some problems. The Marksbury family were talking to me, answering questions, assisting me in any way that they could in attempting to find Paula. And I didn't want that compromised, and they were not happy with the Doherty family being on their property at the same time. As a result, we had to talk to the Doherty family and explain to them that although they had the right to conduct a search, they did not have a right to come on to the Marksbury property. The investigation into Paula's whereabouts continued with interviews of Paula's friends and the Marksbury's neighbors. One neighbor said she might have seen Paula with Nathan after the couple left the bar. Nathan had knocked at their door that night. He said he wanted to party with them. It was late and it was peculiar. They'd never socialized with Nathan before, nor did they want to now. They refused to party with him. They did not see Paula Doherty with him, but they saw the silhouette of a what they took to be a female in the car, but they could not identify that individual because they didn't get out of the car. And then Nathan left their residence, and they never saw him or Paula later that night. It was just another vague clue, but it indicated that Nathan had not gone home alone that night, as he said he did. Other stories were equally vague and equally compelling. Many neighbors, including a state police officer, had seen Nathan working on the farm after Paula disappeared. He tended a fire at the farm's trash dump for four or five days. Then he was seen churning the smoldering debris. Neighbors commented that for Nathan to do any sort of physical labor at all was unusual. He was rarely seen working on the farm. It's just a big open pit. For investigators, Nathan's actions were suspicious. His behavior was not consistent with uh, the Nathan that we all had come to know. Uh, Nathan would not get out and do something like that just in order to clean up the farm. Couple that with the fact that uh, all of the leads about where Paula might be had wound up with nothing. I was really interested in knowing what Nathan was doing, what he was burying in that dump. Despite their suspicions, authorities had no basis for a search warrant. They had no legal right to enter the property. Marksbury was free to continue destroying potential evidence. Twenty-eight-year-old Paula Doherty was missing, presumed dead. Paula's boyfriend, Nathan Marksbury, had been seen burning trash on his parents' farm in the days following her disappearance. Kentucky investigators believed Marksbury was destroying evidence, but their best lead was really no more than a hunch. To test their theory, they needed to check Marksbury's trash pile, but they had no warrant. So they tried the direct approach. They asked his father for permission. To their great relief, he gave his consent to search the grounds, 
just so long as they didn't disturb anything or enter buildings. Anticipating what they might find, the state police brought with them a forensic anthropologist trained to recognize human remains, even when they're tiny shards. At the dump site, that's just what he found. Fragments of human bones. At that time, I stopped the search, secured the uh, dump site, and obtained a search warrant. The warrant allowed the state police forensics team just a few days to search the dump site. Because of the size of the site and the burnt and broken condition of the remains, they needed every minute. Parts were sifted and sorted. Some were large and easy to spot. Others were barely recognizable. Once police had gathered as much as they could find, the remains were sent to the central facility of the Kentucky State Forensics Lab. The lab has the capacity to flesh out a case based on the smallest of clues. It's here that an apparently insignificant fragment can become a crucial piece of evidence. Crimes happen elsewhere, but they're often solved here. The forensic anthropologist must literally put the pieces back together to try to get a picture of the victim's identity and to determine what happened. According to Kentucky State Forensic Anthropologist Dr. Emily Craig, it requires patience and a little soap and water. When we first get the bones in the lab, the first thing we have to do is, is clean them up and uh, we have to get all the debris and soft tissue off of them. And we really have to resort to a procedure we call thermal maceration, but what it amounts to is dishwashing liquid in a crock pot. The cleaned bones are then laid out to see if they are from a single individual. It isn't easy. Fire and mishandling take their toll on fragile bones. It takes an expert eye to recognize and understand how they can be distorted. Part of the problem with burned and fragmented skeletal remains is sometimes a six-foot individual can be reduced to nothing more than the bones you find here in this box. They change size, they change shape, they change color, they break from the fire, but you, uh, you can still go through the ashes and find enough bones in most cases to make an identification of the victim and identify the trauma. Ultimately, the forensics lab had enough to work with. From the pelvis and the size of the bones, it was determined that these were the remains of one female individual. Now they had to prove it was Paula Doherty. To make the identification, the lab relied on the victim's teeth, most of which were recovered from Marksbury's farm. Teeth usually survive even the most intense fires, and they're small enough to avoid being crushed by a killer's mishandling. The records matched the dental remains. Paula Doherty had been found. But finding the body didn't necessarily prove homicide. In fact, once the remains were identified, Nathan Marksbury contacted police to say that Paula shot herself, and he disposed of the body because he felt no one would believe that. Law enforcement didn't believe it, but Sergeant Harrison was afraid a jury might. You work an investigation not to meet the burden of charging someone. You work an investigation to meet the burden of a conviction that will stand up on appeal. And it was a concern throughout because there was, again, there was no crime scene per se. There was no uh, physical evidence per se other than Paula's remains. Marksbury said Paula had shot herself in the head. He gave police the gun she'd allegedly used. There were no fingerprints found. It was impossible for the Kentucky State Police to determine whether she had been the one to fire it. 
If investigators were going to find grounds for a murder conviction, they would have to rely on the remains alone. The forensics lab began the meticulous process of piecing together the fragments of skull collected from the dump site. It was grossly incomplete, but the important parts were there, revealing not one, but two gunshot wounds. They told a lot. Though both shots penetrated the skull, neither was necessarily fatal. The victim might have fired both bullets and bled to death. To test the suicide theory, investigators needed to determine the trajectory of the bullets. Dr. Craig inserted rods into the bullet holes in the victim's skull to ascertain the position of the weapon. She found that Paula could not possibly have positioned the gun to her own head at those angles. Someone else had fired the gun. Nathan Marksbury, you're being Police believe that service. person was Nathan Marksbury. He had the gun. He attempted to destroy the body. Based on the evidence, he was arrested for the murder of Paula Doherty. Nathan Marksbury was sentenced to life in prison, plus an additional 15 years for tampering with evidence. Investigators theorized that on September 15th, Nathan's anger raged out of control. He murdered Paula, then tried to cover up his crime. Marksbury's violent temper found a target in the person closest to him. Harder to catch is a killer whose rage is unleashed on total strangers. Waycross, Georgia, May 30th, 1993. Ray Hampton and Gene Dixon were worried. Both of their teenagers, 18-year-old Charlie Dixon and 19-year-old Jason Hampton, were missing. The high school sweethearts had gone on a fishing trip the day before and had not returned. It was not like Jason to forget to call. The two men drove to their kid's favorite fishing location on the Satilla River. Ray Hampton spotted Jason's truck. Their worst fears quickly became a reality. Ray found the body of his son face down in the dirt. The boy had been shot several times. Gene Dixon's daughter, Charlie, was nowhere to be found. After finding his son murdered on the bank of a Georgia river, Ray Hampton radioed the Ware County Sheriff's Department. His son's young fiance was still missing. Police cordoned off the entire area and carefully processed the crime scene. They searched for anything that might point to the killer. Jason Hampton had been shot in the back Several 22 caliber bullet casings were recovered from the ground near his body. Jason's truck was thoroughly dusted for prints, but none were found. His fishing poles were missing. Police also searched the riverbank for evidence. Still, there was no sign of Charlie Dixon. Local police called the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for assistance. Special Agent Bill Butler took the call. We knew at that time that we had a, a major case on our hands. We had uh, a young man who had been brutally murdered and we had a, another teenage girl who was missing. Uh, certainly there were, was a great deal of concern on all of our parts to find her and to find the perpetrator. Investigators split up into teams to search for Charlie Dixon in the wooded areas along the Satilla River. She was nowhere to be found. But investigators refused to give up hope that they would find the young woman. Seven miles upstream from where Jason's body was found, officers made a tragic discovery. they found the nude body of Charlie Dixon. Like her boyfriend, she had been shot several times. 
It appears to us in the investigation that the sequence of events that occurred was that uh, after Jason was shot and killed at the scene, that uh, Charlie Dixon was also shot and she was taken from the scene and was taken to the wooded area in the north part of the county near the Pebble Hill community. In less than two hours, police were processing their second murder scene. The killer had left behind few clues. No shoe prints or tire tracks were found. Looking for valuable evidence, police collected everything they could find at the scene. Charlie Dixon's body was taken to the coroner for further examination. The coroner determined that Charlie Dixon had been sexually assaulted. Investigators hoped they would be able to extract and identify the killer's DNA from the biological evidence collected. The swabs were sent to the Georgia State Crime Lab for analysis. Forensic biologist John Wagle examined the evidence. When you run the DNA test on the swabs, the first thing you determine is, is there enough material DNA present to continue with the test? And yes, there was. The DNA was viable, but police had no suspects to compare it with. They knew they would have to work quickly. The critical time in any major investigation is the first seven, eight hours of the investigation. Well, that's when you're going to do the most important work that you do in investigation. That includes the crime scene investigation. It includes your initial interviews with uh, uh, victims, friends, and families, and where you're going to find out the most important information in the case that will hopefully lead you to a solution. Hoping to find a lead, police interviewed the victim's parents. The Hamptons and the Dixons told investigators that their kids were well liked by their peers and had never been in any trouble. Charlie, a high school senior, was looking forward to graduation. She and Jason, a freshman in college, had just gotten engaged. The parents told investigators that on the morning of May 30th, Jason picked up Charlie to go fishing. They planned to spend the entire day at the Satilla River. That was the last time they were seen alive. The bullets from the double homicide were sent to the GBI ballistics lab for analysis. The lands and grooves on each of the bullets matched. This verified what officers already suspected. Charlie Dixon and Jason Hampton had been shot with the same gun, a 22 caliber Remington rifle. Police had their first solid lead. As we began to proceed in this investigation, uh, we felt sure that uh, a, a speedy solution would come about because we had ballistics evidence and we had DNA evidence. But they still needed a suspect and a weapon to make a comparison. With no obvious motive, the murders seemed to be the random acts of a stranger. Investigators feared that each day this killer roamed free, more people would die. I know that uh, all of us felt the need uh, to get it solved as quickly as possible before another crime occurred. And when we looked at the brutality of these crimes, we knew that there was a potential there for other people to be victimized. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation teamed up with area law enforcement agencies. Every department was asked to submit reports of recently investigated violent crimes. As we conducted our investigation, we began to look at people who had records for similar crimes. And what we looked at was for any suspect who had a record for either sexual assault, kidnapping, or burglary. Hundreds of potential suspects were interviewed. 60 voluntarily gave DNA samples. The samples were sent to the GBI lab for comparison. 
none of the DNA samples matched the biological evidence collected from Charlie Dixon's body. The investigation stalled. So it's been in your possession all week? Yes. And as time went on, we certainly began to get frustrated because we really developed no suspects that warranted any further investigation into. And uh, certainly we were, we were beginning to doubt whether we would solve this case. By December of 1993, nearly seven months had passed since the murders. Agents from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations were no closer to catching the killer. Investigators in Waycross, Georgia, struggled to solve the brutal double murder of two high school sweethearts. The list of potential suspects climbed to over 1,000. Identifying the killer would take time. And patience was the name of the game. And we preached it every day in our task force meetings to be patient, to keep proceeding, to follow every lead, to document everything, and to keep going ahead until we found the perpetrator of these brutal murders. Their patience paid off. Investigators finally got a break. It came from a local jail. Authorities told agents about a prisoner who was recently placed in custody for violating his parole. The man had threatened to kill his mother and brother with a rifle. His name was Billy Daniel Rawlerson. A background check revealed that Rawlerson was on parole after serving time on a burglary conviction. Where have you been last week? Investigators questioned Rawlerson about the murders. No? You ever been down there? He denied any knowledge of them. Would you be willing to take Before leaving, investigators asked for a blood sample. All right. Go. Rawlerson consented. At the GBI crime lab, scientists extracted DNA from Rawlerson's blood sample. The results of the DNA test reveal banding patterns unique to each donor. The banding patterns from Rawlerson's DNA were then compared to those taken from Charlie Dixon's body. Computer analysis statistically confirmed they matched. No more than one in 10 million individuals could have that pattern and that with a reasonable scientific certainty, the DNA from the biological material on the swab originated from Mr. Rollison. All right, let's search this for you. Police obtained a search warrant for Rollison's home. There, they found two fishing poles. One was identified as belonging to Jason Hampton. They also found a dismantled rifle, a 22 caliber Remington Model 66. Police hoped it was consistent with the weapon used in the murders. The confiscated rifle was reassembled and sent to the ballistics lab for testing. The rifle was fired into a vertical water tank. The water stops the velocity of the bullet without damaging the projectile, leaving the lands and grooves intact for comparison. Examination confirmed without a doubt that the bullets that killed each of the victims had been fired with this rifle. Faced with this evidence, Rawlerson confessed. Conclusive proof that you raped and murdered Charlie Dixon. He told investigators that he stalked Jason and Charlie during their fishing trip. When the couple got into the truck, he shot Jason Hampton. He later raped and murdered Charlie Dixon. On March 5, 1994, 
Billy Daniel Rollerson was sentenced to die in Georgia's electric chair. When a gun is used to commit murder, bullets can provide the strongest evidence of a killer's guilt. Using advances in forensic science, investigators can read clues etched in lead to find justice for innocent victims who have fallen in the line of fire. Police in Northern Oregon are overwhelmed by a string of brutal murders. At first glance, the cases appear unrelated. But as victims continue to surface, the investigation begins to expose a more terrifying truth. A quiet town in Central California becomes the backdrop of a violent double homicide. With no witnesses and little physical evidence, investigators struggle to identify a suspect. To make their case, police must rely on determination, ingenuity, and a little luck. When death comes at the hands of a stranger, investigators depend on the physical evidence to make their case. Forensic science offers the only hope of justice when innocent victims are caught in a killer's deadly aim. before dawn on October 9, 1992. Dispatchers from the Hillsborough Police Department received a 911 call. A resident living along Cornell Road reported hearing multiple gunshots. Police arrived at the scene to find an abandoned 1966 Volkswagen Beetle pulled up onto the sidewalk. The car was riddled with bullets. Shattered glass, a purse, and traces of blood littered the front seat. Over a dozen bullet casings were scattered on the ground. In the glove compartment, police found the vehicle's registration. The car belonged to a woman named Martha Bryant. driver's license found inside the purse also belonged to her. But Martha Bryant was nowhere to be found. As officers tried to piece together what had happened, another call came in from police dispatch. Yeah, go ahead. Half a mile away, right, witnesses gotcha. reported a woman lying bleeding in the road. The officer arrived to find paramedics frantically working to save the woman's life. He recognized her from the driver's license photo. It was the owner of the Volkswagen, Martha Bryant. She had been shot twice. The emergency team rushed her to the University Hospital in Portland. But after several hours of fighting for her life, 41-year-old Martha Bryant was pronounced dead. Later that morning, authorities contacted her husband. He couldn't imagine anyone wanting to harm her. He said that Martha was a dedicated midwife at the hospital where she worked. You want to hold? It wasn't unusual for her to be at the hospital well into the morning hours, helping families bring new life into the world. 
Martha Bryant just didn't seem to have any enemies. At autopsy, the medical examiner noticed signs that Martha Bryant had been sexually assaulted. A single nine millimeter bullet had pierced her lung. But it was an execution style shot from a 22 caliber weapon to her right temple that killed her. The slugs were removed and forwarded to the crime lab. Number four. 30 degrees. Okay. Criminalists at the Oregon State Police Crime Lab began scouring the Volkswagen for clues. Two is... Number one, 20 degrees. Trajectory analysis showed that Martha Bryant had driven through a hail of bullets. Number five, 30 degrees. Okay. Examiners determined that 17 rounds had pierced the car. The attack had come from two positions. From the right rear of the vehicle and from just outside the passenger window. It looked like an all-out ambush by someone determined like to kill her. Next, examiners compared the bullets collected from the vehicle to those recovered from the victim. They matched. And the markings left on the bullets told investigators that a Browning 9mm handgun had probably fired them. Examiners also confirmed that the fatal shot to the victim's head had been fired from a different weapon, a 22 caliber handgun. This suggested two shooters. With no motive and no obvious suspects, Hillsboro police believe this would be a difficult case to solve. Detective Michael O'Connell of the nearby Washington County Sheriff's Department was asked to assist in the investigation. It was extremely unusual, the, the, the extreme violent nature of it, the senseless, random nature of it. It was unlike anything that, that we had had, or in, unlike anything that had happened in the, even in the whole Portland metropolitan area. News of Martha Bryant's murder sent shockwaves through the community. The public came forward with dozens of tips, but they all led nowhere. Two months after the shooting, the Martha Bryant investigation ground to a halt. But Detective O'Connell refused to let this senseless murder go unsolved. Believing that Martha Bryant had been randomly targeted, O'Connell began reviewing another cold case he was working from a year earlier. That victim also seemed to have been targeted by a stranger. He began looking for signs that the two cases may be connected. Try On April 19, 1991, hands. Washington hands. County investigators were dispatched to the home of an elderly Hillsboro resident. There, they discovered 62-year-old Margaret Schmidt. Can get in that angle there. She had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and then suffocated with a pillow. The only piece of evidence recovered from the scene was a man's size eight and a half Reebok sneaker print left in some spilt talcum powder. The subsequent investigation into Margaret Schmidt's murder had uncovered no solid suspects. Margaret Schmidt had no enemies, led a very quiet lifestyle. Um, there were no actual witnesses that night to this person sneaking into her house. Other than the shoe prints, we had nothing else to go on. After reviewing the case file, O'Connell could find no similarities between the two murders. 
The MO in each was radically different. The only thing that Martha Bryant and Margaret Schmidt shared in common was that both appeared to be unlikely victims. Still, investigators at the Washington County Sheriff's Department needed to find a way to close these two investigations. And their caseload was about to increase. Two months after Martha Bryant's murder, a passing truck driver spotted something on the side of the road. As he got closer, he realized he had found the lifeless body of a young woman. He immediately called the Washington County Sheriff's Department. Detective Scott Ryan received the call. The information that we had at that point uh, was not specific. Uh, the people on the scene did not know if it was the victim of a hit and run or if the body had been dumped for some other reason. When officers arrived at the scene, they found that the victim had been shot at point blank range from underneath her chin by a 22 caliber pistol. She had also been badly beaten and sexually assaulted. But other than the bullet used to kill her, no physical evidence was recovered. Investigators had no idea who this woman was or why she had been murdered. Hoping to identify her, the victim's fingerprints were run through the police database. They got a hit. Records indicated this victim had been charged on a minor violation a few years earlier. She was identified as 23-year-old Shanti Woodman of Portland, Oregon. Detectives interviewed Woodman's friends, but no one had any useful information. She was known as a free spirit, and everyone fully spoke with liked her. Like the Margaret Schmidt and Martha Bryant investigations, the murder of Shanti Woodman quickly threatened to go cold. To keep the number of unsolved murders from growing higher, Washington County authorities organized a task force comprised of officers from area law enforcement agencies. The difference in the ages of the victims and the different MO in each murder led the team to conclude these cases were unrelated. And though a 22 caliber handgun had been used in two of the murders, examiners at the lab concluded they were different weapons. For the next several months, police followed hundreds of leads in each of the three unsolved cases. But despite their efforts, little progress was made. And then, new reports of violence began to pour in. The normally quiet community of Hillsboro seemed to be caught up in a deadly crime war. As police in Hillsboro, Oregon struggled to keep pace with the growing number of unsolved homicides in their community, a new rash of assaults were being reported. Investigators learned that two elderly women had been attacked in separate incidents. Police spoke with one of the victims who was still recovering in the hospital. She said a man came to her door asking to use a phone. Once inside, he attacked her. But the woman managed to activate an alarm pendant. The assailant panicked and fled. The woman was certain that her attacker was a man who used to live in her apartment building. 30-year-old Caesar Baroni. The second victim was also able to identify Baroni as her assailant. A warrant was issued for his arrest. 
Investigators quickly tracked Baroni to a local bar. He was placed under arrest for the two assaults. Stand up, please. Put your hands on the bar. Unlike the unsolved murders of Margaret Schmidt, Martha Bryant, and Shanti Woodman, it seemed the latest rash of violence would be quickly resolved. At the weekly task force meeting, Detective O'Connell learned about Baroni and details of the recent assaults. Baroni had an extensive felony record, which included a number of assaults and rapes on elderly women. As he continued listening, Detective O'Connell realized that the M.O. of the recent assault bore striking similarities to one of the unsolved murders that of 62-year-old Margaret Schmidt. Right away, we're speculating, could he be responsible, at least, at the very least, for the murder of Margaret Schmidt because of the age of these victims that survived and the fact that the one victim lived only a block away from Margaret Schmidt. How are you doing? Though it was only a hunch that the cases may be connected, detectives interviewed Baroni in jail. He claimed he had never heard of Margaret Schmidt and denied any involvement in the recent assaults on the elderly women. Having been positively identified, investigators were convinced that Baroni was lying. Looking for any useful information, they asked him if he owned any weapons. To their surprise, he admitted to owning several. One, he said, was a Browning 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Investigators had been searching for the same type of gun in connection with the shooting death of 41-year-old midwife Martha Bryant. The hunch that Baroni was connected to the murder of Margaret Schmidt had uncovered a possible link to another unsolved case. Looking for evidence that could tie Baroni to the two murders, police obtained a warrant to search the house he shared with a roommate. He showed up at the same time as the night. The man led them to Baroni's Browning 9mm semi-automatic pistol. We sent that gun in to be test fired and compared to the Martha Bryant ballistics evidence. But at that time, it was only a hunch. There was nothing that directly led us to believe that he killed Martha Bryant. Police continued searching for evidence that could tie Baroni to the unsolved murders. In his bedroom, they found another potentially vital clue. A pair of Reebok tennis shoes the same type of shoe that had left the print at the Margaret Schmidt crime scene. At the crime lab, examiners analyzed the shoes recovered from Baroni's house. They were determined to be Reebok ERS tennis shoes, size eight and a half. Examiners overlaid Baroni's shoes onto transparencies of the print lifted from Margaret Schmidt's house. The unique characteristics present on the treads of Baroni's shoes were identical to those found at the crime scene. Examiners concluded that Baroni's shoe had left the print. Speculating that they had inadvertently exposed a serial killer, investigators turned to the gun recovered from Baroni's house, the one suspected in the shooting of Martha Bryant. Criminalist Chris Johnson fired the Browning 9mm weapon into a water recovery tank. Under a comparison microscope, the samples were compared to the 9mm bullets recovered from Martha Bryant's lung and from her Volkswagen.
Detective O'Connell was contacted and given the results of the analysis. Chris Johnson test fired that Browning 9mm pistol and determined that that gun and that gun alone had fired those bullets removed from her Volkswagen and had ejected those casings found along Cornell Road to the exclusion of any other gun in the universe. It was an absolute solid positive match. Though it was powerful evidence, it didn't prove that Baroni fired the fatal shot. Let's check out the other side. Which had come from a different weapon, a 22 caliber pistol. As police searched for that gun, they got a break. An inmate locked up with Baroni came forward. The inmate said Baroni had been bragging about the murder of Martha Bryant. Baroni told the inmate that he was the lone gunman. He had used the 9mm to shoot up the victim's Volkswagen and then the 22 to deliver the fatal blow. And that wasn't all. Baroni had bragged that he and another man had committed yet another murder several months before that had remained unsolved. The details of that homicide also sounded familiar to investigators. Detective Scott Ryan reviewed the inmate statements. One of the cases that Mr. Brony had described to the inmate was a case of a female who was uh, picked up in Portland, transported out west, and uh, raped and murdered. There was only one case that that could be consistent with, and that was the death of Shanti Elise Woodman. The investigations into three seemingly unrelated homicides were converging, exposing a trail of murder that led to one serial killer. Now, police needed to find hard evidence to make sure that Caesar Baroni would never be free to kill again. Having conclusively tied suspected serial killer Caesar Baroni to the unsolved murder of Margaret Schmidt, police in Hillsboro, Oregon now sought to link him to the murders of 41-year-old Martha Bryant and 23-year-old Shanti Woodman. Baroni's alleged accomplice in the Woodman murder was tracked down to a local jail where he was serving time on an unrelated charge. Nothing, huh? Perhaps you might be able to tell me what you're... At first, Leonard Darcell was uncooperative. But after being confronted with the inmate's testimony, he decided to talk. Darcell told the detectives that he and Baroni had met Shanti Woodman in a Portland bar the night she was killed. They conned her into Baroni's car. Once inside, Baroni beat and raped her. Then they drove her to a remote location. Darcel told police he begged Baroni to just leave her alive by the highway. But Baroni shot her anyway, using a 22 caliber pistol. Though police were getting close to making their case, they needed to find the weapons used in the Martha Bryant and Shanti Woodman murders. In the course of interviews with Baroni's acquaintances, the police learned that he had scattered guns all over town, leaving many with ex-girlfriends. Police tracked down and collected several of these weapons including a number of 22 caliber pistols. The weapons were forwarded to Chris Johnson at the Oregon State Police Crime Lab. Before the test firing, however, Johnson decided to first swab the barrel of one of the weapons that was consistent with the gun used to kill Martha Bryant. We knew that the head wound to Martha Bryant was a contact near contact 
and that with a gunshot wound you can get high velocity blood spatter. We swab the outside of the barrel and the inside of the barrel first before we test fired it to check for back spatter. We were able to find blood inside the barrel. DNA testing showed the blood on the inside of the gun barrel was consistent with blood recovered at autopsy from murder victim Martha Bryant. This was the link needed to prove that Baroni's gun delivered the fatal head wound. Examiners at the crime lab were also able to conclusively tie another of Baroni's 22 caliber guns to the murder of Shanti Woodman. In all, Oregon authorities had linked serial killer Cesar Baroni to three unsolved murders. Detectives marched into the Washington County Jail and charged Cesar Baroni with the murders of Margaret Schmidt. Martha Bryant and Shanti Woodman, and also with the assaults on the two elderly women. Based on the evidence, police believe that Baroni constantly prowled the area, searching for vulnerable women to abduct, molest, and kill. Though he targeted elderly women, anyone who crossed his path was a potential victim. Not only had he gone after so many elderly people that should have had some type of peace in their later years, but he'd uh, performed some very terrifying attacks on, on some people that were just totally unsuspecting as to what a predator he really was. Cesar Baroni stood trial for the murders of Martha Bryant, Shanti Woodman, and Margaret Schmidt. In all three trials, he was sentenced to death. For his involvement in the Shanti Woodman kidnapping and murder, Leonard Darcell was sentenced to 20 years without the possibility of parole. Serial killer Cesar Baroni waited until his victims were alone before attacking. Other killers strike whenever the opportunity presents itself. Atascadero is known as a small, peaceful town nestled in the foothills of California's beautiful central coast. But a handgun will shatter the tranquility of any town, and Atascadero is no exception. In the early morning hours of February 5, 1987, police and paramedics were dispatched to an apartment complex. There, they discovered the body of a young woman lying on the sidewalk. She had a single gunshot wound to the left temple. The emergency team also removed a nylon stocking that had been used to gag the victim. As crime techs fanned out to search the area for evidence, Police began interviewing residents at the complex. They identified the woman as their neighbor, 22-year-old Lori Rainwater. They said that they had rushed outside after hearing screams, followed by several gunshots. But because of the fog, they couldn't see anything clearly. They had no idea who could have done this. As the search for clues continued, police discovered another victim at the rear of the building. He was dead, the victim of a gunshot wound to the chest and an execution-style shot to the back of the head. He had also been gagged with a stocking. Neighbors later identified him as Laurie's husband, 25-year-old John Rainwater.
police made their way to the couple's apartment. There, they discovered that the bedroom was on fire. This killer had gone to great lengths to obliterate any trace of himself from the crime scene. Police in Atascadero, California, continued searching for clues in the double homicide of John and Lori Rainwater. After extinguishing a fire that had been deliberately set inside the couple's apartment, police began processing the scene. Blood spatter found throughout the apartment suggested a vicious attack. No fingerprints were discovered. Police did find evidence that the murdered couple had been bound. Yards of duct tape used to bind them were recovered. They also found two makeshift mittens made from socks wrapped with duct tape probably used to keep the victims from loosening their bonds. As the search continued, police noticed two empty jars on a table. All of the items were collected and sent to the crime lab for a closer examination. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that each of the victims had suffered deep, blunt force lacerations. There were also signs that they had been sexually assaulted. But it was a 38 caliber gunshot wound to the head that killed both John and Lori Rainwater. The recovered slugs were forwarded to the California Department of Criminal Justice Crime Lab. As examiners started processing the evidence, investigator Bill Hanley of the San Luis Obispo County DA's office began looking for leads. With no eyewitnesses to the double homicide, there were no immediate suspects to pursue. The homicide occurred at approximately 6 a.m. It was a very uh, foggy, dark morning, uh, which hindered eyewitness is ability to uh, see anything clearly. With little evidence to go on, investigators turned to the victim's Jackie, families for information. Mrs. Martinez, Lori Rainwater's mother, could not imagine anyone that would want the couple dead. She said that John and Lori were a happy and deeply religious couple. They worked several jobs one of which included taking care of the apartment building for their landlords. They carefully budgeted their money. In fact, they had recently saved enough to move to a bigger apartment in order to raise a family. Mrs. Martinez said Lori had stored their savings in small glass jars. Investigators realized that those jars had been found empty. The information led investigators to theorize that robbery was the motive behind these savage murders. They hoped the evidence could tell them more. The duct tape and the empty jars believed to have contained the rainwater savings were analyzed by latent print examiner Marty Collins. An inspection of the jars, however, revealed no signs of fingerprints. Next, Collins turned to the duct tape. But the tape was stuck together and crushed. Once you get the tape that is stuck together, although there are ways to try and take it apart, the uh, chance of getting latent prints is greatly diminished. Traditional methods of locating and raising a print were unsuccessful.
But Collins had one technique left to try, a dye staining process. After applying the chemical rhodamine 6G to the tape, a laser light was applied to the evidence. The dye adheres to any latent prints present on the tape. Under the light, a small section of a fingerprint emerged. But the discovery was not that encouraging. Collins realized that this evidence could not be compared to prints already on file. The print from the tape was from high up on the tip of the finger not on the pad of the finger where inked prints of suspects are taken. Over the next few months, police developed several suspects. They were all brought in for questioning, but eventually fingerprint analysis eliminated all of them. For Detective Hanley, it seemed that the investigation into the deaths of John and Lori Rainwater was at a standstill. Due to the high publicity of the case, for approximately the next two and a half months on a daily basis, uh, up to 16, 17 hours a day, we ran down leads. Uh, these leads were from different parolees or uh, offenders in the area to people calling up and saying that they believe that their neighbor did it, although having no really proof on it. All the leads that we had run into uh, came up to be dead ends. But then, on April 29, 1987, two months after the murders, police received a phone call from a woman who claimed to have information about the Rainwater homicides. She agreed to come in and answer questions. The informant said that she had met the Rainwaters a few days before they were murdered. While looking for an apartment, she and her boyfriend, Dennis Dwayne Webb, had spoken with them. The Rainwaters explained that they only collected rent money from the tenants for the landlord. They didn't actually rent out apartments. But while in the apartment, the informant noticed that her boyfriend was constantly glancing at the money jars on the kitchen counter. For investigators, the story hardly proved murder. But there was more. She went on to say that a week or so after meeting with the Rainwaters, she and Dennis Dwayne Webb were arrested in a drug raid. Police had collected drugs and several weapons, but failed to find a hidden 38 caliber pistol. Having followed the double murder investigation in the media, the informant knew that was the same type of gun used to kill John and Lori Rainwater. The informant was released on bail the following day. Shortly thereafter, Webb called her from jail. He wanted to talk about the hidden 38 caliber handgun. She advised me that at Dennis Webb's insistence that she was to dismantle the gun, take it to the coastal area in California, and throw it off the cliff into the ocean. The informant did as she was told. After taking the gun apart, she drove to a remote area along the coast and threw the gun over a 300-foot cliff. After months of having no solid leads, police now considered Dennis Dwayne Webb as the prime suspect in the murders of John and Lori Rainwater. But to make their case, they needed to locate the murder weapon. And after viewing the area, investigators were not optimistic. Frankly, when I went there and noticed where she did throw it off, I thought there was little or no chance of ever recovering that weapon again. 
members of the search and rescue team from the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Department were brought out to the site. After surveying the area, the team meticulously mapped out their mission. They double-checked all of their equipment to ensure their safety, and then geared up. It was now up to them to rappel down the perilous cliff and search the beach below for the weapon believed to have been used to kill John and Lori Rainwater. As investigators in Atascadero, California, continued searching for evidence in the slayings of John and Lori Rainwater, they finally got a break. An informant admitted that at the instruction of her boyfriend, Dennis Dwayne Webb, she had thrown the murder weapon off a 300-foot cliff into the Pacific Ocean. Though finding the weapon seemed like a long shot, the search and rescue team slowly made their way down the sheer cliff. Because of the treacherous conditions, it took the two-man team nearly three hours to reach the bottom. Once there, they began searching for the gun. For over an hour, the search turned up nothing. But then, under some rubbish, they found what appeared to be the frame of a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. Though it was badly damaged, police believe they had found the murder weapon. The team made their way back up the cliff and turned the gun over to investigator Hanley. For him, its value as evidence was questionable. Looking down the barrel of this weapon, this was covered completely in rust. Frankly, I didn't think we were going to be able to get any type of ballistic help at all from this. Police sent the gun to the California Department of Justice Crime Lab. Technicians managed to reassemble and clean the gun enough to test fire it. test-fired bullets were then compared to those recovered from John and Lori Rainwater. The markings left on the bullets as they traveled down the barrel of the gun matched in some areas, but not all. Investigators were building a good case but they were still a long way from proving murder. Police turned to their informant for help. They wanted to try and coax Webb into a confession. They asked his girlfriend to wear a wire and record conversations with him in prison. She agreed to cooperate despite the danger of being exposed. I'm convinced that the informant's motivation was only to see that justice was done. At no time during the investigation did the informant ask for any leniency on any pending criminal case she had, uh, nor did she ask for any type of reward that was out there. It was only to see that justice was done. During their conversations, Webb made no overt references to the murders. He believed that the correctional facility recorded all conversations. 
But when the informant told him she was worried that police suspected him in the murders, he began talking. But he spoke in code. Police were able to break it. For instance, when he referred to the weapon that was recovered off the coastline, he referred to that as a cat. Um, when he would talk about killing somebody, he would talk about popping grapes. It was that kind of code that we had to decipher. Webb assured the informant not to worry. In addition to discarding the murder weapon, he said he had made certain that none of his prints had been left behind. Though Webb's statements were incriminating, they fell short of a confession. But they were enough for investigators to obtain a warrant to search Webb's car. Underneath the driver's seat, investigators found a roll of the same type of duct tape found in the Rainwater's apartment. In the trunk, they found a receipt for the tape, the right stamped there. with the date and time, February 4th, 1987, at 8.37 p.m. The purchase of the duct tape had been made just hours before the Rainwaters were murdered. Though convinced that Webb was the killer, police still needed to physically link him to the crime scene. Because the print on the duct tape found at the scene was from high up on the finger, examiners were unable to match it to any of Webb's fingerprints already on file. But investigators were able to obtain a court order to get new prints, this time from the area high up on Webb's fingertips. Marty Collins of the Department of Justice Crime Lab performed the analysis. With the use of a uh, five power magnifying glass, I compared the photograph that I'd taken of the print on the tape with the inked fingerprints of Dennis Webb and until I found uh, the finger that was identified and I found a sufficient number of ridge characteristics to make the identification. The analysis proved that Dennis Dwayne Webb had bound the victims with the duct tape. The information was enough for investigators to charge him with two counts of capital murder. Investigator Hanley. Police theorized that after seeing the money in the Rainwater's apartment, Dennis Dwayne Webb began plotting to take it from them. A few days after that chance encounter, he returned to the couple's apartment and forced his way inside. Not only did he steal their savings, he also terrorized and tortured them for hours. When the couple managed to somehow escape, Webb chased them down and murdered them in cold blood. He then set the place on fire hoping to destroy any evidence he may have left behind. On June 20th, 1988, Dennis Dwayne Webb was convicted of burglary, robbery, and two counts of murder with special circumstances. During the penalty phase of the trial, Webb testified and for the first time admitted his responsibility for the deaths of John and Lori Rainwater. After hearing his admission of guilt, the jury sentenced Dennis Dwayne Webb to death. Stranger on stranger homicides are among the hardest to solve. But fortunately for investigators, killers always leave clues behind. They rely on forensic experts in the lab to help them solve the crimes and bring about justice when killers take deadly aim.